Oh yes, thank you. Full screen. Full screen. Oh, first. Okay, from from the first time. Yes, first try. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, uh, good morning, Philip. Good morning, everyone. So we already have 35 participants online already, and we have a few in the class. Um, so, but yeah, you're welcome to start now. I think that's a good number. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, thank you. So good morning, everyone. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I hope you have a, you had a good night because today you will be, uh, you will have a, a long day uh, and uh, a lot of work to do. Uh, and so today we'll be mostly focused on the, uh, on the group exercise as a, uh, I told you uh, yesterday we will uh, give you uh, three uh, accident cases, and so by group. Uh, so you, you, we will have we will uh, the organizer Ungvet has created uh, six uh, six groups, and so all of these six groups will have to apply one of the um, analysis method uh, applied to one accident uh, case. So I will explain you exactly. Uh, uh, what you will have to do, uh, but at the end, so you, you should expect to uh, have a, a PowerPoint presentation. And so at the end of the day, you will uh, give your uh, PowerPoint presentation for the, uh, uh, for the other group members. Okay, so uh, this morning, we are going to go uh, in more details in uh, the models and the uh, analysis method. And uh, among them, we will have uh, the one that will be used for the group exercise. Um, and so, uh, as you as you remember, probably uh, tomorrow, we uh, I told you that uh, this analysis method are extremely important when you are doing <clears throat> an investigation, uh, because this is a way to control all the bias, you know, all the limitations of the investigation uh, process. Of course, you, you can investigate without any method, and maybe you are uh, already investigating uh, incident or accident uh, without any uh, method, but the risk is to uh, that your uh, data, the way you are uh, collecting your data, the way you are processing or analyzing your, your data will not be exactly, uh, you know, uh, the best way to um, identify the root causes and so identify what are the uh, best uh, mitigations uh, measures. Uh, so these models and methods, uh, they are classically, um, uh, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are classified into three uh, generations, because of course, this is something which have uh, been improved uh, with time. Uh, so there is a, is a traditional uh, uh, techniques, and then there have been uh, uh, progress which have been done uh, on, on these uh, models and methods. So the three generations, are uh, the first one is a simple linear model. So you see we have two uh, models, uh, which uh, I will give you a few uh, information on these two uh, models. So the dominoes model and the fault tree models. Then we have what we call the complex linear model, where you, you see the idea, the main change compared to the first generation is that we have the concept of multiple causes. Okay, so we assume that accident uh, do not occur only because of one cause, but because of the interaction between several causes. And then we have the third generation, uh, which are called the complex nonlinear models, where you have a, a different comp, uh, uh, concept, uh, especially the concept that says that uh, accident occur because of, uh, of a complex combination of causes, including some causes which are not uh, active causes. Okay, something which uh, did not really. Uh, uh, show up during the accident, you know, but something which is uh, latent uh, uh, in in the system. So I will uh, I will go back on that uh, later. So this is the three uh, generations. Uh, so another way to uh, show them, you see, uh, and this is to give you more 
information about the uh, chronology of uh, uh, the development of, of this method. So the sequential model of simple linears have been developed uh, in uh, 19 uh, in the 20s, so on the last uh, centuries. Uh, and the principle of the of the causation is just the single cause, you know. Uh, and so uh, this is what we call the, the root cause. So the, the root cause concept comes from these uh, sequential models. Then uh, we have the epidemiological model. So uh, uh, epidemiology uh, refers, you know, to uh, uh, the uh, the research, uh, the study of the of the sickness, why people uh, may start to be uh, sick. And so uh, in the epidemiological uh, model, you have the idea of complex uh, linear, uh, complex linear models. And then we have uh, a third princi uh, principle of causation, which is a complex outcomes. Uh, so we call it emergent. Okay, it means that um, we 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 may have even we, we may uh, have no failures at all. Okay, but the combination of several conditions may provoke the accident. And so this is called nonlinear, and they have been developed in the 80s, okay? And the epidemiological model have been developed uh, uh, starting in the 60s. So you see, it's quite important to see that uh, this is something which have been progressively uh, developed. Uh, it has been developed also because there is a lot of research, okay? This is a, a research area, uh, but also because uh, the complexity of system has, uh, ver has significantly increased, okay? For, if you compare uh, the system, the organization in the last, uh, uh, in the early uh, time of the, uh, of the last centuries and now the complex system that we have, you know, we made of course a lot of, uh, uh, change and so this is why also this model has to be uh, adapted. Uh, another way to, uh, if we want to go in, in a little bit more details, uh, so here you will find again the three generation sequential, epidemiological, and systemic models. We have what we call some metaphor. So a metaphor means that um, the uh, the people who have developed this model, you know, use some. Um, um, approach to uh, or some image to compare or to to try to uh, make uh, the system more understandable okay so the sequential model the famous metaphor is a domino you know the domino effect means that uh, if one domino is falling down uh, it makes falling down the second domino and so on so you have a sequence of events that you can uh, describe uh, I will go back on that on the next slide. And so the management principle is a never management. So here, what you are trying to do in this first generation of model is to suppress error. Okay, so you should identify errors. Uh, and so in the model, the causes can be clearly identified. And so the, the response, the way you are managing uh, the accident to try to avoid the accident is to eliminate uh, the causes. Uh, which should eliminate the accident. Okay, so this is the first uh, generation. Epidemiological, I would like just to go back on, on the term epidemiological because we, we heard a lot of uh, epidemiology with uh, since the COVID-19. And so people who are working on epidemiology try to understand why sickness, uh, for example, if we take the COVID-19, they try to understand why some people uh, develop some severe uh, forms of COVID-19, while other people have only mild symptoms, you know, or even uh, no symptoms uh, at all. So they study all the interaction between some factors like your age, um, your um, comorbidity, you know, so all the sickness that you have, uh, your uh, uh, also the obesity, which is uh, one of the uh, comorbidity uh, factors. And from that, they try to uh, evaluate the probability that you will develop a, a severe form of uh, COVID-19. Uh, COVID so here, the, uh, the term epidemiology refers to the idea that accident also occurs because of interactions between different uh, factors. Um, and so the management principle is um, uh, the management of the performance deviation. Okay, And the performance deviation refers to uh, what we call the latent failure. So a latent failure is something which is in the system, Okay, which, is, uh, which might be in the system for years, uh, 
but which has never uh, produced an accident for years. Uh, but when come uh, when comes uh, some uh, uh, interactions between different failures, it will uh, produce the accident. And so what you are what you have to look is to uh, look at deviation at the blunt and sharp end. You remember we we used the terms yesterday: blunt and sharp end. Sharp end mean the people on the workstation, so pilots or cabin crew, and the blunt end mean uh, people who are in the organization, like uh, the managers, uh, the trainers, uh, people who have designed the equipment, and so on. Uh, and so deviation, so the response here, uh, which is expected to produce positive effect on safety, is, uh, is that uh, deviations leading to that accident must be suppressed. Okay, so we try to identify the deviation. And so the deviation, again, refers to the latent failure, and they should be suppressed to suppress the accident. And finally, the third generation so is called systemic. And so systemic means that you are looking uh, not only to failures, but you are looking to variability into the system. Okay? And so the management principle here is uh, the performance variability. Um, and so the sources of variability can be identified and monitored. Okay? Uh, and it does not mean that you should reduce at, at all always the variability. Sometimes you should amplify even the variability, or sometimes you should reduce the variability. And so the principle is that every system is very much variable. You know, when you are doing your, your, your work every day, you are never doing your work exactly in the same way. Why? Because uh, the environment is also changing always. Okay, so you see here, uh, this is uh, uh, described as a variability, you know, like a signal, like an electronical or electric uh, signal. And sometimes all of these variability, when they come together, they may produce an accident. You know, it creates uh, what we call a resonance effect. And so the resonance effect will produce uh, an accident. So I will go back also in more details in a few, uh, in the few coming uh, minutes. Okay, so starting by the domino uh, model. So the domino model, again, is one of the first models which have been developed. You see, it's, it was in 1931. Um, and so you see here uh, the different uh, uh, dominoes that you may have here. So you have the social environment. Here you have a person with the fault of a person. Here you have the hazards. Here you have the accident, and then you have the injury. So the last domino is always uh, the consequence of the accident, which is produced by the previous uh, domino, which is the accident. Okay, And so accident is described as a chain of events that lead to the failure. Okay, And this is quite easy to describe the accident. So one event causes the next. And so this is a famous domino analogy. I'm sure you, you have, uh, you have uh, already seen you know, the, some domino games where people are you know, creating a lot of uh, sequence of uh, domino uh, falling down. And so specific causes can be identified and removed. And this is the principle, the prevention principle. So if you are able to identify a cause here, if you remove the domino, okay, normally you should remove uh, the accident. So in this model, in this approach, you focus only on what went wrong. There is no idea of latent condition at all. So you are only considering that accident occurred because of active failures. Okay, and so it's a very linear thinking. It means that we can predict that if something happens, you know, uh, an accident will uh, occur. So this model is quite, I mean, um, acceptable for very simple accidents, like you know, a walking, uh, a walking accident, an occupational accident. So where one only one person is injured. Uh, because uh, he or she is falling down uh, in uh, on the ground, you know, in a, in a workstation. So this kind of model is able to explain this simple accident. But if you want to explain, you know, an incident or even an accident in a complex, uh, in a more um, complex system like uh, uh, an aircraft accident, of course, it the model will not be enough to really explain the accident. So the this is a model, okay, and then uh, they have developed 
um, I'm sorry, they have developed uh, some analysis techniques and the analysis, analysis techniques is called the event tree analysis. And I'm sure you heard about the uh, event tree because this is something which is quite used in the industry. And so you, it's, it's used to consider many chains of events in parallel, okay? And so each task activity is decomposed in constituting elements. So you have here, you see one task is uh, decomposed in different subtasks, you see A, A, B, and so on. And each success can be done correctly or incorrectly. So you, you have two possible outcome, which can be the correct execution and the error, okay? So you really identify uh, in your system everything which went wrong, okay? Uh, and uh, this is used also to do some risk assessment because here you can even uh, provide a, a, a basic occurrence probability. So what is the probability that this task will be done correctly or, uh, or will be done uh, incorrectly? So you see it's based really on probability. So the problem with uh, these techniques is that it's quite difficult really to, um, um, to account for the complexity of the system because this model really assumes that accident occur because of very uh, simple causes uh, and very isolated causes. And again, when you consider complex system where you, you should consider all the uh, um, organizational dimension, uh, the human factors dimension, this model is not really enough to uh, cover all, this, uh, all of this complexity. So we'll not really use these uh, techniques anymore uh, today. Uh, now, uh, from the... Uh, uh, from the middle of the uh, of the second century, we have uh, other model, and this one has been very much used in aviation. This is the shell model. So the shell model really look at the interaction between different parts of the system. So it goes much beyond uh, compared to uh, the linear models that we have just uh, seen. So shell model uh, include four uh, four areas. Uh, the first one is. Uh, the S is software. So software refers to uh, everything in the system which is not uh, material, like the rules, the regulations, uh, the training. Okay, so this is why we call it software. Okay, it is not the software in terms of computer software, but it refers, you know, to everything in the system which is not uh, equipment. Okay, so rules, regulation, and training. The H stands for hardware. So hardware is, uh, as it is called, all the technology, tools, equipment, okay? The E stands for the environment. So the environment uh, of work might be the physical conditions of work, like temperature, lighting, uh, and so on. And finally, you have the L. So the L refers to the liveware. So liveware is everything about the human. Uh, so, uh, other people, colleagues, clients, suppliers. And as you can see, they put two L in the model because, of course, we know that uh, you have uh, in interactions between uh, the, uh, the human into the, into the system. Okay, so uh, the assumption of the model is that system fa failures originate from failure in one component or within the interactions between two components. And you see here in the uh, you have the four boxes, and what you are looking in the model, you are looking to the interactions between the various uh, areas of your uh, system. Okay, so the shell model is very well known to be. Uh, uh, in, in aviation because it's a model which have been uh, proposed by ICAO to describe accident. And it also supports um, uh, a classification, an accident classification, which is called ADREP, uh, A-D-R-E-P. I guess you heard about, about ADREP. This is the accident classification used uh, worldwide by the ICAO uh, to describe and to uh, code all the accidents or incidents that may occur in the world. Okay, so the idea was to create a shared database uh, by, all, by all the um, state members in the world, describing with the same methodology uh, the accident. And so the shell model was a model which was used to classify the uh, accident. Okay. Uh, so now there was 
a clear, uh, you know, um, a clear change, a very significant change on uh, on these different uh, accident models and techniques uh, from one book, which is a, a book which was written by uh, Perrault, uh, Charles Perrault. He was a, a very famous. Uh, uh, a uh, guy working on an uh, accident and describing complex accident in several industry like uh, uh, nuclear power point uh, or, um, or aviation. And so uh, he has developed the normal accident theory. So I don't know if you heard about the normal accident theory. Can you tell me? Mm -hmm. I never did. Uh, never no really. never okay okay and you you know when we when we talk about the normal accident theory it's quite strange to say normal accident no <laughs> yeah you yes. know because of course in general when we are talking about accident we consider that this is something which is abnormal okay so here he develops the idea that accident may occur in a normal situation which is again really strange because when we when we see an accident, we consider that this is not a normal situation. Okay, so the uh, main concept uh, which is behind the model is that systems are becoming more and more complex. Um, you know, instead of directly controlling the system, the operators supervise their operations. Okay, in an in in an aircraft, uh, the pilot most of the time the pilot is not. Uh, controlling directly the aircraft, but the uh, pilot is supervising a system that controls the aircraft. And this is the same principle for other industry, like uh, in a nuclear uh, power plant, you know, uh, this is no more the operators that really control the system, but they are supervising a computer that control the system. So we have, of course, higher co cognitive control. So more and more, you know, this system uh, requires a lot of uh, cognitive uh, control and no more physical control. You know, when you are a pilot, you are no more, you know, uh, directly controlling the aircraft. Uh, like uh, it, it was the case in, uh, in uh, I don't know, 50 years ago. But no, you are supervising uh, computers that control the aircraft. And so in complex system, uh, interactive complexity and tight coupling made the accident inevitable. Okay, so it was really the assumption of uh, Perot is that the system start to be so much compl uh, co uh, so so complex that they are very difficult to predict. You know, the behavior of the system start to be very difficult to uh, predict, and this is what we call the tight coupling. So tight coupling means that uh, between different parts of the system. A small things, you know, a small viability may provoke, you know, a big, a big consequences. Um, you know, this is a butterfly, a butterfly. The uh, uh, how do you call it? Uh, uh, the, the butterfly phenomenon. I don't know if you heard about the butterfly phenomenon. Okay. Yes. What well, yeah. What does it mean? It's like a small thing. Things that happen in one place can lead to something else in another place. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So this is the idea that uh, you, you know exactly a small um, a small effect may produce big consequences, even sometime uh, remotely. You know, not not exactly at the same place. And so uh, and the idea also is that systems are more complex because they are more protected by a number of differences. So we we have tried to to develop or to protect so much a system by a lot of differences. Uh, and all of these differences start to make the system very complex and very difficult to uh, predict. And so also the system, uh, the, the features compared to uh, older system is that they have little tolerance to variability. That means that a small variability again may provoke a lot of uh, consequences. So in the book of uh, uh, Charles Perrault, there is a, uh, he, he starts the, the book by a very nice uh, story, you know, very, uh, I mean, it's a daily uh, story. So uh, let's see the story. You have an important decision meeting downtown. Okay, so your spouse had already left and unfortunately she left the glass coffee pot on a lit burner and it cracked. 
you desperately need your coffee, so you remerge around for an old coffee pot. You pace back and forth, waiting for the water to boil while watching the clock. After a quick cup, you dash out the door. You get in your car only to realize that you left your car and apartment keys inside the house. That's okay. You keep a spare house key hidden outside for just such emergencies. Then you remember that you gave your spare key to a friend. Okay, there's always a neighbor's car. He doesn't drive much, so you have to borrow his car. He says generator went out a week earlier. Well, there is always a bus, but the neighbor informs you that the bus driver are on strike. So <laughs> you call a cab, but none can be had because of the bus strike. You give up and call in saying you can't make the meeting. Okay, so your input is not effectively argued by your representative and the wrong decision is made. Okay, so here we, we don't have really an accident, but we have what we, we can say a mission failure. Okay, so the, the story did not really end as uh, expected. And so, as you can see here at the end, uh, the meeting was not able to, uh, uh, to give a, a, a good decision. Okay, so the question is if you do the analysis of this event, which is again, not really a, a serious accident, but I mean, it can describe exactly uh, different sequences of events and conditions. Can we say that uh, what, what was the primary cause of these mission failures? Is it the human errors? Is it uh, sorry, is, uh, mechanical failure? Is it the environment? Is it the design of the system? Is it the procedure used? Or is it the schedule expectation? So can you tell me what is the primary cause of this mission failure? So you, you understood what happened in the, uh, in the story, right? Yeah. And so if you analyze this incident, can you tell me what will be the primary cause? Human error? Um, I think it's yes. not, uh, it's not um, really easy to identify the root causes here because um, all of the cause is connecting together. Uh, if this not, uh, for example, if, um, uh, she not leaving hid under the court or forgetting the keys. So it's not, uh, she's, she has not uh, to find, uh, to ask the neighbor, to borrow a neighbor car or something. I mean that uh, it's connecting by chance. If this not happen, so it's that not happen. So it's not easy to identify the primary cause here. Yes, this is a, this is a very correct uh, answer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We can't say that there is a primary cause, you know, or only a, 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 a single cause to explain the accident. Exactly as you said, all of these are very much connected. And if you just remove one, one part, you know, uh, like uh, if you just remove the, the, the human errors, the other things will never happen. Okay. And uh, the, uh, the guy, uh, the person will be able to go to the meeting. Okay, so we can only explain the accident if we consider all of these multiple causes. And we can just have a single uh, cause which is uh, uh, describing the accident. And so you see, it's a very important uh, uh, example that really shows us that we need really to consider the interaction of the causes rather than trying to find only one single cause as we did you know, in, in, the, in, in the past when we were analyzing uh, an accident, we were trying only to look at the one cause that will explain all the other, uh, all, all the accidents. This is just impossible because systems are too complex. And so you see here, uh, what also is, uh, I, I think it, it, we, what we learn from this uh, simple story is that it might be very small things and this is also the effect, the, the famous butterfly effect, you know, uh, all start from just, you know, uh, a coffee pot. Everything starts from a coffee pot, so which, is, which has nothing to, to do with a meeting uh, downtown. But these small things 
produce you know a, a, a big big consequences uh, because at the end you have a mission failure okay so it's quite interesting to see how much uh, this uh, complexity may lead to uh, accident and this theory has uh, uh, led the um, people working on safety to produce different kind of models and the famous model probably one of the most famous model being the swiss cheese model okay which have been developed by reason so the initial model was developed in 1990 but then the model has progressed so there were several versions of the model uh, uh, until 19 um, 97, where he has re written his last uh, book on, on the Swiss cheese uh, model. So here the model is looking to different productive planes and relative uh, types of uh, um, failures, okay? So you see, uh, and this is a famous Swiss cheese model, and you have four planes, okay? And all the slides, the four slides represent some defense and safeguard against accident okay so something which is normally supposed to avoid the accident so here you have the accident which is again uh, the starting point of the analysis and here we have the four barriers which are normally supposed to avoid the accident and you are going when you are going from the left to the right to so from this first barrier to the last barrier you are going from the sharp end so the sharp end again is the people working on the workstation a pilot a, a cabin crew uh, um, a maintenance engineer and the more you are going on the left the more you are going on the uh, blunt end so all the organizational uh, influence so and the holes represent the errors within the barrier okay everything that fell in the uh, in the system uh, which may produce which may explain the uh, at the end the accident and so the idea the assumption of the model if you take some slice of swiss cheese okay uh, and of course you have holes and they are, they are randomly located on the on the slice and normally you know uh, when you uh, when you put uh, together all the slides, you should avoid the accident because the holes are not aligned. Okay, no, so normally you don't have here the alignment between the different holes in the slides. But of course, as we have some variability in the system, all of these slides tend to move, of course, and sometimes we are creating the conditions to align all the holes and then the accident occurred. okay so the assumption of the model is that uh, when everything is aligned you know all the conditions are uh, met we are uh, the, the accident may uh, occur so as you see uh, the model um, uh, distinguish between two types of failure, the active failures, which occurred really uh, on the workstation, okay? So this is really, uh, we are on the concept of errors and violation, and all the other uh, uh, difference uh, are um, associated with latent failure. So latent failures, latent, I, I don't know if you understand the terms latent, this is not a term we use every day. So a latent condition is something that is in the system, okay? Uh, but which has not provoked accident, okay? This is something which is not really visible, but this is a small default. This is a condition that sometimes may produce an, uh, an accident. Uh, I don't know, and maybe to explain you this, uh, the, 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 the difference between a latent failure and uh, an active failure, we can take an example, which is the Helios accident. Have you, have you heard about the Helios accident? This is an old accident in aviation that occurred in Greece. I don't know if you heard about this accident. No? Helios. So what happened in the accident? So the, uh, the, the aircraft... Uh, took off from uh, Cyprus and the uh, aircraft, the, the flight was from Cyprus to uh, uh, to Athens in, in Greece, okay? And so the aircraft took off and at some point, there was no more contact between uh, the flight crew and the air traffic controller. You know, the air traffic controller called the crew, but no one answered from the crew members. 
uh, and so the aircrafts, uh, uh, I mean, follow uh, its, its path. And uh, at some point, the air traffic controller asks to some uh, fighters to see what happened in the aircraft. Okay, so they, they send two uh, F-616, and the fighter look at what happened in, in the aircraft. And what they found is that all the passengers were wearing the oxygen mask. Okay, and the two and the pilot was uh, probably you know uh, died into the into the into the cockpit, and they did not have the uh, the oxygen mask. Okay. Um, and so, unfortunately, you know, the fighters can do anything with that. And so the aircraft finished uh, the flight uh, close to Athens. And at some point, there was no more fuel in the, uh, in, the, in the aircraft. And so the aircraft crashed. OK? Maybe you heard about this accident. It was really a, a, terrible, a terrible accident. Uh, so they did the analysis. And they found that it was due to the fact that uh, the uh, depressurization system was not on when the, the aircraft took off. Okay, and so this is why the oxygen mask fall down for the passengers, but uh, the uh, uh, pilot uh, were unable to control the aircraft. I mean, they, they did not notice that there was a depressurization problem and so they all uh, i mean uh, uh, fainted and they uh, died after a few minutes because there was no more oxygen in the aircraft okay uh, um, so do you remember this accident or the cause some of you maybe uh, recognize this accident no yes we do Okay, and so can you tell me if you uh, if you uh, remember what was uh, the main causes of the accident? What was the the conclusion of the uh, of the accident analysis? Uh, if I remember well, that is um, a part of uh, the technical problems of the depressurization have been uh, uh, from from the old engine from seven three seven an aircraft, and uh, there is an undepressed. Uh, the pressurization valve uh, uh, from the bridge system it doesn't work properly or, or it, if uh, or it's work on the maintenance uh, um, a period of time ago but it, it doesn't really fix properly and then uh, when when took off uh, the the pressurizer uh, uh, the pressurization system of the aircraft it's uh, slowly uh, decrease which is made the human brains uh, doesn't recognize that that uh, pressurization. Then uh, the whole pilot, the whole crew was uh, starting uh, slowly, slowly um, uh, uh, getting the unconscious conditions. Yeah. But uh, the the cabin crew, uh, uh, the cabin passengers still have the oxygen because that is the system of the aircraft and when it's over forty thousand feet of the, the cabin altitude, so the, uh, the, the oxygen mass is automatically brought down, but not for the cockpit because the pilot has to put it by himself. Yeah. That is uh, slowly getting in conscious, so uh, uh, that's why the, the, uh, the accidents happen. Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, I agree uh, on, on most of what you have said. The, the only things uh, is that um, the accident was due to the fact that there was a maintenance uh, check uh, yeah. maybe two hours before the flight and the maintenance, uh, the technicians, he forgot to put back, to set back uh, the system from manual to automatic. So, you know, in the aircraft, uh, on this uh, aircraft, you, there is two positions, uh, auto and manual. And so to do the check, he put, he set it on manual and he forgot at the end, after the uh, maintenance check, he forgot to Put back the the, the 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 system on auto. So when the uh, the crew came into the uh, into the cockpit, they also they did the checklist, but they failed to correct the position of the of the switch from manual to auto. So it means that when the aircraft took off, it took off with the depressurization put on manual and not on auto. So that means that the system never, you know, uh, never uh, started. The pressurization system never started. 
And so what happened is that, so the aircraft, uh, there is some uh, systems that, that are supposed to warn the pilot that the, uh, uh, the aircraft is not pressurized. And there is a warning, you know, a sound warning in the flight deck. So the warning has started, but the crew um, uh, interpreted the warning uh, to be, uh, you know, um, uh, associated with another failure, uh, with another problem, which was, uh, if, I, if I'm not wrong, with the conf aircraft configuration. So they thought that there was a configuration problem of the aircraft, while the sound was for the pressurization. Why? Because the warning, you have the same warning, exactly the same sound for two different problems, pressurization and aircraft configuration. And so the crew, you know, didn't, as you say, did not notice or did not interpret the sound as being associated with the pressurization. And so, as you said, uh, they, as in this case, they have to recognize the warning to take the mask, the oxygen mask, and to put by themselves uh, the oxygen mask, which is not uh, the same case for the passengers because for the passengers, it's for, it falls down automatically. Okay, so in this accident, we have two kinds of failures. We have active failures, okay? And we have latent failures. Can you tell me in this simple accident, or simple, not really simple, but in this accident, uh, what are the failures, uh, the active failures and the latent failures? The active failure is the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the pilot, when, when they are not checking properly, they check this before. Or before the flights. Yes. Uh, for me, there is an uh, uh, and and also is the the, um, uh, the alarm warnings when when the failures happen, and uh, uh, they uh, as as far as I know, when when you have something wrong in the cockpit and and they uh, they call out an alarm, uh, they should be have message shown up in front of the the pilots. Just to properly check so which which alarm is it, but uh, the the, uh, the pallet here was mistaken between the the aircraft configurations with the pressurization system. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is uh, uh, the mistake of not properly checking is is the active failure. But yeah. there are two failures happen at the same time. We can consider that that are latent failures, yeah. and also uh, the uh, the second latent failure is for the. Um, for the pilot size, uh, with the uh, the mistaken of the maintenance personnel when when they are not uh, pushing the push button on, on, on the right positions yeah. from from manual to auto. Very good. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So we, we clearly see exactly uh, the, uh, the 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 active failures and the latent failures. So the active failures, as you said, is the mistake of the pilot who did not correct, uh, who did not check correctly the uh, position of the switch, but also the maintenance engineers who forgot. You know, so it's it's an omission. He forgot to also set back the. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the correct uh, position and the latent failures is more associated with the design of the system. You know, the way the system have been designed, especially the fact that there was two, uh, uh, the, the same warning may um, uh, tell you different, different things. Okay, so there is no uh, clear uh, distinctions between two different warnings. The same warning may uh, tell the pilot uh, two different things. And there was also in the investigation report something which was quite interesting, more related to the organizational influences. Uh, especially, you know, the pilot, the captain was, uh, if I remember well, German, and the co-pilot was Greek. Uh, so their uh, English skill was not also very good. Uh, the safety culture of the airline was not really uh, good. So there was uh, the training of the pilot, especially the CRM training was not so good. And so it has also, you know, influenced the accident. So it's really, I think, a very good example of accident that reflects all the complexity of the accident and the combination between the active failures and the latent failure. If you just remove something in the system, probably you don't have any more the accident, okay? So you need to have all these conditions to really um, explain why the accident uh, occurred. 
Okay, so uh, I will not go in too much detail, but just to let you know that after this first version of the model, there was some evolution in the model, especially, again, not going in too much detail, uh, there was um, also the, the, the switches model has evolved in a way that you may also have some accident without any active failures, you know, like in the NASA Challenger accident. I don't know if you remember the uh, this accident where the accident was due to uh, uh, just a small, um, how, how do you call it? Uh, I forgot the term in English, but a, a very small piece of the uh, uh, Challenger shuttle, okay, very, very, very small. And um, at the time of the accident, there was some weather condition. So it was quite, it was, it was very uh, cold. And so this small piece uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the shuttle, you know, the behavior of this small piece in the, in the shuttle was not as expected. So there was no really uh, active failures. So the shuttle took off and it took off because there was a lot of organizational pressures to launch the shuttle, you know, because there was a media, there was a lot of uh, uh, a lot of organizational pressures, and so finally uh, the uh, accident occurred, but only because of latent failure. There was no really, you know, active failures in this specific uh, accident. So, as I told you yesterday. The switches model is a very uh, useful and uh, very nice model, but uh, it's not enough really to do the accident investigation. So to do the accident investigation, you need uh, um, a technique, you need a method. And the method for the switches model is called the HFAX. So HFAX stands for Human Factors Analysis and Classification System. Okay, so this is a way to apply the switches model, but in a practical way, because if you just use the switches model, you can't really do your analysis. So uh, this is a classification system. So you see you have a, a kind of a hierarchical system with different, and you will find the different layers, starting from the un unsafe acts. Then you have the precondition for unsafe tags, the unsafe supervision, and the organizational uh, influences. Uh, and so this is a very comprehensive framework to identify and classify the causal factors uh, in the accident or accidents. So it's a hierarchical structure. It means that you have a total of 19 causal factors organized in four categories, the four levels, okay? And you have a total of 19 causal factors. And for each of these causal factors, you have some specific items which are, uh, which, which are given by the, uh, by the analysis method. Uh, and so did you receive the uh, uh, HFAX? Because I, I send you, uh, I send um, to Ungviet the uh, classification. Have yes. you received the, okay. So they have all the, the classification. Okay, perfect. So it provides data for developing safety intervention because from that you may identify exactly uh, the cause of the accident and of course try to manage the cause of the accident. Uh, and so it's probably the most used human factor accident analysis framework. And so this is why, you know, uh, I wanted to uh, give you more detail on that, uh, on this uh, method today. So I will go back on that when I will introduce the group exercise. So this is for HFAX. And then we have another one, which is also uh, quite famous, uh, which is called the tri tripod beta. Uh, beta, sorry, uh, where, uh, and this is the basis of the bow tie. So bow tie will go back on, on, on these techniques because uh, this is a, the other techniques that we are going to use today. We are going to use the HFAX techniques and the bow tie techniques. Uh, so uh, the tripod beta is really a model or a technique which is uh, meant to, uh, to, to do some risk assessment. So the idea is to predict what, uh, what accident we may have, uh, you know, in, in a specific system based on uh, the chain of events, okay? Uh, and so the final event is here, you know, this is a top event, so this is the accident, and this top event is explained by a chain of uh, sequence which normally are, are avoided by barriers. So the, the, the key concept of uh, this approach is the barriers, the barriers that should normally have stopped 
the chain of events. Okay, and so you are going from underlying cause to immediate cause that may produce the event. So you see, it's quite close also to the switches uh, model. Uh, and here, what the really the model is focusing is on the barriers, and so the model or the technique is really focused on uh, to identify the reason of failures for each broken barrier because the accident here is uh, assumed to occur because of a broken barriers which is normally supposed to avoid this uh, accident and so this should be broken down in the human failure which is again you know like for the switches model the active failures and the working environment aspect, which are the precondition and the latent failure in the organization. So you, you find again, you know, the concept of uh, active failures and latent uh, failures. So con the concept of barrier is very important because we sometimes we have some confusion uh, in the different levels of barriers. Uh, you see, you have different kinds of barriers. A barrier might be something which is physical or material okay so in this case it will prevent an actions or event uh, like you know having a seat belt a seat belt is really a, a, a physical barriers that avoid the consequences of an accident um, and so it hinders the transportation of materials and energy like fences railing walls and buildings so they are physical barriers that normally avoid you know uh, the accident or the consequences of the accident. Uh, okay, so this is the first, uh, first, uh, first case of barriers. Then we have some functional barriers which are supposed to impede actions like you know interlocks or in the physical movement like locks or airbags or prevent access to an area like password or entry code. This is also, you know, a barrier, but it's more a functional barrier. It's not a physical barrier. Um, then we have the symbolic barriers, like, you know, prevent actions, like color coding of functions, demarcating demarcations, so it's difficult to say, uh, indicate the status of a system like our alarms and warnings. So they are symbolic, they are not physical. They will not, uh, uh, I mean, uh, they will not avoid the accident if uh, people cannot interpret uh, the symbolic barrier. So they, have supposed to, they are supposed to be interpreted by the human uh, in uh, the system. And then we have to we have what we call organizational barriers, like you know safety principle, guidelines, uh, regulations. They are also barriers, but you know different kind of barriers. They are not physical. They are not symbolic, but they are something which normally should regulate a system. Okay, so when you are talking about barriers, don't think only about the uh, technical barriers or physical uh, barriers. So, and excuse me. Uh, so, from this, uh, me <sighs> sorry, <laughs> it's very cold in Paris now. <laughs> uh, so, from these techniques, we have the famous bow tie, and so the, the bow tie will be the the method that we'll use uh, today. Uh, so here you see, again, you have the top event, which is the middle of the bow tie. So you see what means a bow tie, you know, when you are wearing a bow tie, uh, especially men when they are wearing a bow tie. And so here in the middle, you have the top event, okay? And so the top event occurred when you're exposed to a hazard, okay? So a hazard might be something that may produce the top event. Then you have on the left of the uh, of the bow tie model what we call the threat. So the threat is something that may increase the probability that a hazard will produce a top event. Okay, so I will give you uh, a simple example uh, later. And all here you see you have the barriers that are supposed to avoid the threat to produce a top event. Okay, so on the left part you have everything that may explain the occurrence of the accident. And on the right part, you have the consequences. So you, have, you will find also some barriers, okay, which are supposed to avoid the consequences of the top event, okay? So uh, let's take uh, an example. If we consider uh, you are driving your car, 
what is supposed to avoid, you know, and you, you, I don't know, uh, let's take uh, the hazard like a uh, slippery road, you know, because it's raining, okay? Uh, so what are supposed to avoid the accident to occur? Can you tell me? What in your system, when you are driving your car, which is supposed to avoid uh, the, the fact that you will leave the road and have an accident? So on the left part. The brake on the car. Mm -hmm. Exactly, you have you have a brake system which is supposed to avoid, and this is a barrier, of course. Yes. What else can we have? Uh, uh, so the brake is really uh, is more uh, a physical barrier, but can we have some more? Uh, I don't know symbolic barriers. It is and this uh, the, the signal. The signal, yes, and especially yeah. you know for the symbol, the limit speed, for example, when you are in exactly. the road. Exactly. Yeah, if speed you, limit. Uh, yeah. Try to speed. too fast, not good. They had a limit. Yeah. yeah. Limit speed, exactly. for example. Yeah. yeah. Anti skid yeah. anti skid system. So what sorry? Anti skid system. Anti skid yeah. skid. Anti skid system, exactly. So this is more technical barriers, exactly. So I know finally, I don't know, some of these barriers uh, failed. And so you have the accident, you have the top event, okay? Mm -hmm. What are now the barriers, what, what might be the consequences of the accident? If you have an accident, what might be the consequences? Blockage of road, blockage of traffic. Uh, yes, but I mean, before that, <laughs> for, for the driver. Yeah. Yeah, he may die, yeah. you know, he, he, yeah, he, may, he, he might be injured. And what are the barriers here to avoid or to reduce the consequences? You have the safety bag. Exactly, airbag, you know, seat belt, uh, the design of the, aircraft, of, the, of the car. All of these barriers are supposed not to avoid the accident but they are supposed to reduce the consequences of the accident, okay? So here on the left, you have, like, uh, as you said, the speed limit, the brake. So they are supposed to avoid the accident to occur. The police? Here, the police, yes. <laughs> we were, yes, the police. Normally, it's, it's, a, it's a good barrier to avoid, uh, <laughs> to avoid uh, having too, too high speed. Uh, yes. And so this is some, <laughs> something which is supposed to avoid the accident. And here on the right, we have barriers that are supposed to reduce the consequences of the accident. Okay, so now the last one, uh, no, oh, almost the last one, we have also the cream model. Uh, normally, I was initially uh, was supposed to explain you the cream model, but it's very long to explain. It requires a lot of time. So I decided not to, ex to, to go in too much detail. But the cream method, uh, it's, it's both, in fact, actually, it's bo both a method and a, and a it's both a model and a method. And so the CREAM model is based on the fact that uh, accident occurred uh, because of the combination between three areas, which are human, the technology, and the organization, okay? And so uh, in the method, which is a CREAM method, which is the analysis techniques, you go from the general consequences of failures, okay? So starting by, uh, I don't know if you have a collision between two cars, you will, this will be the general consequences of failures. And you will go from these general consequences to the, uh, you know, the cause which are here. And uh, to go from the general consequences of failures to the, uh, to the cause, to the root cause, you have, uh, they use what they call a failures mode. So failures mode is a classification system that will take you from the general consequences to the, uh, uh, to the, to the road causes. And so they use, uh, you know, some uh, other metaphor uh, with uh, genetic, you know, in genetic, you have, you have the phenotype and the genotype. And the genotype. Can you, diff can you, do you know the difference between the phenotype and the, geno and the genotype? I don't know if you study biology, maybe a long time ago. So the phenotype describe, you know, this is how the genetic express. Like, you know, the fact that my uh, 
hairs are blonde, I have the uh, uh, white skin, uh, I'm tall, and so on. So this is the expression of my DNA. And the genotype is the DNA. You know, this is something which is hidden, but which is in the system uh, or in, in the body, which is not visible. Okay, so uh, the idea of the CRIM model is to, is to go from the phenotype. And so they, they assume that the accident is like the phenotype and the genotype is really, you know, the uh, uh, root cause of the accident. And this is uh, due to the combination of man organization and technology. Okay, and, uh, and so this, uh, this has been described by Holnagel, he's a very famous uh, author, uh, he, he had written a lot of books on uh, uh, analysis uh, model on accident investigation, so it was the first uh, method that he has, he has described, and then he has developed another one which is even much more complex, which is the FRAM, mo uh, the FRAM model. So the FRAM model assumes that accident occurred because of the variability between different uh, aspects of the system, okay? So the idea is to break down your system in different functions, okay? So here you see the small part here, are the functions, function. So a function is something that you need in your system to, uh, I don't know, to produce. Uh, if you are, an, uh, let's take an, uh, an aircraft, a flight, uh, uh, a take, takeoff is a function, okay? You are supposed to take off the aircraft. And so to do, to do the takeoff, you have different conditions, okay? And what assumes the model it assumes that all of these functions may have some variability. So you see the small red uh, here symbol mean that all of these functions may have some variability. Variability means that they are changing every time, you know, from day to day, uh, the functions are not exactly executed in the same way. They are changing because every system is under variability, okay? Because you have to adjust, to different conditions because I don't know the weather, the weather condition are not the same. Uh, you may have some failures in the equipment, and so all of these functions will have some variability. And what assumes the model is that uh, the accident occurred because of a combination of all of these variability. Okay, so. What and I will not go in. No, I will not go in more details on these uh, models because it, it's quite complex. But here, uh, what is very interesting in the model is that it says that accident may occur even if you have no failures, but just because you have different small variability and the combination of this small variability may produce accident. And if you are interested, but I will not go in, in too much in, in more detail. They were able to explain, you know, some accident like the Conair flight uh, uh, 5191 uh, um, only by using the model. And this is, so this is a description, you know, of the, uh, of the accident based on the FRAM model. And they were able to really describe very accurately why the accident occurred in the absence of failures, okay? Just because some small things have changed and that at some point it has produced the accident. So if you are interested, I can give you uh, the full report or more information about this model, but uh, yeah, I was not uh, intended really to give you more detail uh, today. So for today, what we are going to, uh, we are going to, to go in more details in two techniques, in two methods that we have already uh, described, but no, I, I will go in more detail. So which is the HFAX models. Uh, Ashfax method, sorry, and the bowtie method. And so this is the one you will have to use today in your uh, accident case analysis, okay? So Ashfax and uh, bowtie. So uh, Ashfax uh, method, just to give you a little bit more complex, uh, the primary analysis, it was a primary analysis tool for accident investigation and identification of causes. So it's very much used in the US, uh, especially by the, uh, 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 the uh, NTSB or also by the military when they want to analyze an accident. And it's also used to do the accident coding. So accident coding 
is when once you have investigated your accident, what you want to have is a description of your accident in a database. And so to do that, you need a coding. So a coding is uh, the fact that you will describe exactly what happened in the accident. And so this, again, this is a secondary analysis tool. So to do the uh, HFAX database, and so really to analyze some trends, you know, because what you want at the end, when you have several incident or accident, you want to analyze trend and to see what area of uh, uh, system you should improve to reduce uh, the risk of accident. So, HFAX is a comprehensive human factors analysis and classification, again, which is based on the switches model. Uh, and the objective is to identify and classify active failures and latent failures. Okay, again, the concept of active and latent failure. So it's really a multi dimensional approach to errors and not only based on. Uh, active failures and it describes the whole, the famous holes in the switches because when um, Reason has developed the switches model, there was a lot of frustration because when people, when investigators wanted to really use the switches model, they have a lot of difficulty really to describe the holes in the switches. And so the HFAX model is really meant to help investigators to identify the holes in uh, your system. So it's used within the military, commercial, and general aviation, so to systematically uh, examine the underlying uh, human causal factors, human and organizational factors in the accident. So just to go back on the concept of active and latent failures to be sure that uh, it's well understood by everyone. So active failures is actions or inactions by individuals, okay? So this is something which has been done or not done the day of the accident. And they are really the last act committed by the operators, often with immediate consequences. You remember yesterday when I show you the uh, sequence of accident, we, have start, we, we always start from the right to the left. And so the immediate, uh, immediate uh, conditions that produce the accidents is generally uh, errors or violations, okay? And so the second concept in the switches model uh, is the latent failure, which is a pre-existing condition within an organization which directly affects the sequence of accident events. So it may lie dormant. So you see dormant undetected for some period of time, like uh, in the Helios accident, you know, the warning, the sound warning was here in this Boeing uh, 737 for years, but it, it has never produced an accident before. And it's not to be overlooked within the causal sequence of events. So very often, you know, these uh, latent failures have not been really the focus of the investigation, while we know that they are key aspects uh, to understand the accident. So you remember, I, we already, uh, I will already show you this, uh, uh, figure ju just to go back a little bit uh, in more detail. So here you have the accident or the injury or the, this is the occurrence, okay, to be more generic. Here, the first slice is the active failures or what we call the unsafe acts. And then we have the three other slides, which are the latent conditions. So something which is in the system and which have contributed to the accident at some point, okay? And so the holes, are the fail or absent defense, something which has net, not worked to avoid the accident. Uh, so the defense against failures are modeled as a series of barriers, or we call it also the layers, the famous slice of the switches, and the holes in the layer represent the fail or absent as a mitigation control. So the so things that are supposed to reduce uh, the uh, accident probability. And so, the, the main assumption of the model is that accidents happen when the holes in each of the sites momentarily align. Okay, so you see, you, you, you can see here that they align so that the hazard passes through the different layers of defense leading to the unwanted outcome incident or accident. Okay, so this is uh, the main assumption of the model. And so again, switches is a theoretical framework and HFAX is really, you know, the way you will apply the model. And so now to go back on HFAX, you see 
you will find your four layers, unsafe acts, precondition, unsafe supervision, and organizational uh, influence. And so what we are going to do now is to describe in more detail all of these four layers, because again, this is the one you will have to use uh, today in your uh, group exercise. So starting by the unsafe act, unsafe acts, they have been uh, broken down in two uh, kind of unsafe act. And you will find again something that we have uh, covered yesterday, the errors and violation. You remember errors is something which is done without any, uh, not by willingness, you know, this is not an uh, uh, intentional, while violation is something which is done uh, uh, with, with purpose, uh, by purpose. So errors have been again broken down in three kinds of errors. They might be decision error. So this is something which have been wrongly decided. It might be skill-based errors, or it might be perceptual errors, okay? And then we have violation. This violation may be routine. So routine means that this is something which is uh, done maybe every day, you know, or very frequently, uh, because the system has been designed like this and people, uh, and people used to work like this. And then we have the exceptional violation. So this is something which happened only, you know, uh, uh, very unfrequently. So this is the, the first slice of the switches uh, model. And so in the document I, I gave you, you will have all the description of skill-based, decision error, perceptual errors, and violation. Okay, so uh, I will leave you to uh, look at uh, the documentation. And so you will find when you will apply the models, uh, the method, you will find uh, the uh, correct answer in this uh, documentation. You will find, you know, uh, some things that really describe what happened in the accident. Normally, it's quite exhaustive. It means that it's quite complete, and you will normally you should find uh, all you need in the uh, in the documentation. Then you have the precondition for unsafe acts. So you see, this is the layer which is before the unsafe acts, and so this is the condition of the aircrew as is affect performance. Okay, and so precondition have been uh, broken down in two kind of uh, uh, in two two other condition, which are the substandard condition of operators or substandard practice of operators. So you see, condition is something that happen. Uh, during the accident, so it might be adverse mental state, adverse physiological state, or physical mental limitations, while substandard practice of operators are true resource management, mismanagement here in, in, in this case, or personal readiness. And again, you will find all the items which are associated with all of this uh, uh, classification, okay? And then we have the level three, which is the unsafe supervision. So the third slice here, when you are going from right to the left. Uh, and here, so this is again in the latent failures. They are tracing back the event to the supervisory chain of command, like manning practice, CRM training, and so on. And so they have, they have been broken down in four categories inadequate supervision, plan inappropriate operation, fail to correct a problem or supervisory violation. Okay, and then again, you will find in the documentations all of the, uh, you know, item which are associated with these uh, four uh, categories. Uh, okay, uh, and then we have the final slice, which is the organizational influences. So you see, you, we are much uh, further in the system, you know, we are no more in the system or, I mean, in the workstation, but we are something which is uh, much, uh, uh, much more in the organizational, in the organization. So it might be the resource management, the organizational climate, or the organizational process. And here again, they have been described in the documentation, you know, uh, and so you will find exactly what you need to do the, uh, your uh, analysis. Okay, uh, so here, this is the HFAX procedure. So when you are going to do your uh, analysis, uh, uh, I mean, after the break, after the coffee break this morning, uh, you, are, you will have to identify and classify. So the underlying, of course, human causes of accident, of aviation accident. And so the sequence must be examined in its entirety. 
And so what, what it means, it means that you should not stay in the cockpit, you know, or in the work session. You should really describe all the sequence that really explain the accident going from the unsafe act to the organizational uh, climate, okay? Uh, and so you go backward, you know, or upward in the hierarchy, starting again from the, from the unsafe act to the organizational uh, organizational uh, influence, okay? Uh, so this is, you know, how you will do. Of course, today we'll not, we, 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 we don't have really a lot of time to train on that, but the idea will be for you at least to uh, start to apply the, 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 the method and also maybe to see, you know, the, uh, and I, I, will, I will give you more instructions on the group exercise, but, you know, the idea will be more to discuss uh, the uh, advantage of the method, but also the limitation of the method. And then the second method that we are going to use, that you are going to use today, is a bow tie, or especially the incident bow tie, because the bow tie is more the risk assessment method, and the incident bow tie is a method to uh, analyze incident or accident. So bow tie, and this is exactly what I told you here, uh, so I just keep this because I think it's not really useful. I already explained you, you know, the uh, the uh, the concept of the of the bow ties. So, uh, just and I gave you the documentation of the bow ties. So normally you should have uh, all the information to 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 apply the method. So here again you have the hazards, you have the top event on the left. You have everything that should normally explain why uh, the the top event occurred, and here on the right, you have all the barriers and all the, the chain of sequence that explain the consequence, okay? So, this is the two, two methods, Ashfax and Bowtie. And so, the, uh, what you will have to do, uh, so starting after the coffee break, you will have to apply these two methods to one of the three uh, case studies, okay? And so the case study is uh, three accidents. And so normally you, you, have the, you have the accident report as well, just to confirm that yes. you have all the documentation. Yes, okay. sir. Yes, yes okay. sir, we got it. Okay, very good. And so you have been allocated for uh, in one of the six group, okay? So because we have three, three case studies and two methods, so it means six, a total of six uh, groups. So we have the Kansas City accident, we have the Washington accident, and we have the Ajana airline accident, okay? And so here you will find on, in the slide just a small uh, a small uh, summary of the accident, but normally you have the full uh, report, uh, so I don't, I, I don't want to spend too much time uh, because you have all the uh, detail of the accident in the uh, full report. So, no, what I'm, uh, I, I'm expecting from you for this uh, group exercise today is to conduct the accident analysis based on the available data. Because of course, uh, I'm not asking you to collect any data because of course it will be uh, just impossible. And so just using the report, you have in the report, you have all the, the data which are available. And so the idea will be to use either the Ash, Ashfax method or the Bowtie incident method to analyze the data which is which are in the uh, in the report and so the idea will be to conclude the investigation and discuss the strengths and weakness of the apply method you know again the idea here uh, we, we you don't have very much time to do that to do the exercise so i'm not really expecting you a full analysis or a perfect analysis but more you know for yourself to ask yourself some question about how these methods are very are useful, you know, because you can also compare the fact that you are not using any method and the fact that using a method, how much it helps you to do the data analysis and also the strengths and, wakeful, and, and, and weakness. Uh, and so each group will have to prepare a 10 minute PowerPoint presentation. So, you know, at the end of the day, uh, what we are expecting is that each of the six groups will do a 10 minute presentation uh, with a PowerPoint uh, support. Uh, and then we'll have a, a short discussion after all of the presentation. Okay, so 
uh, we we need a total of two hours uh, for uh, for you to present and so to 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 have some time to uh, discuss uh, your uh, results. And so normally you have been allocated to uh, one of the six group. Okay, so group number one will be Ashfax applied to the Asian airline. Uh, group number two will be Ashfax applied to Kansas City. Uh, group number three will be Ashfax applied to the Washington accident. And uh, group number four will be the Bowtie applied to Asian Airline. And group number five will be Bowtie applied to Kansas City. And Bowtie uh, uh, applied to Washington will be for group six. And so the, the main interest of, the of, of this group exercise is that we'll have for each accident cases two you know, two, um, uh, two presentations, one for, with Ashfax and one with Bowtie. And so at the end, we can compare, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, I, I would not say really the quality of the investigation, you know, but the kind of uh, outcomes of your investigation and how much we may um, produce some uh, interesting prevention measure start using Ashfax or using Bowtie. Okay? So, uh, do you have any question on, 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 on the exercise? Is, is that clear? Do you have all the documentation that uh, you need to have? Because no, uh, after, so we'll have the coffee break. Uh, so the coffee, now uh, in Vietnam, it's 10.30, uh, 10.25. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay, 10.25. So, so 10.25, okay. So the idea will be, you need at least for my, previous experience, you need around three hours, you know, to prepare everything uh, among the group, okay? So uh, three hours, it means that uh, you need uh, a little bit of, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, this morning, you know, the second half of the morning uh, to prepare the group exercise and around one hour in uh, after the lunch, okay? So from now till, let's say, uh, 2.30, uh, in the afternoon, you will uh, you will have to prepare the, your presentation. After uh, and then you will we will have a, a coffee break and then we'll have the group presentation. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, perfect. Yes. Uh, anyway, so we can have a quick break and then yeah. uh, after the tea break and coffee break, I will explain again one more time in Vietnamese. And just okay. to make sure everyone has the emails and the documentation that they will need for the um, group discussions. And yes, we can kind of, yeah, continue. Okay. On. Yeah. And I will be here to answer any questions, of course. Uh, then I will leave you uh, walking, uh, but uh, you can just contact me if there is any question. Maybe you can send me, uh, I don't know, uh, a message on, um, you know, on WhatsApp, and then I will be here to to answer any questions okay? okay because i can go from one group to another but uh, i mean um first you, you need to go uh, in the exercise and probably we will have uh, you will have some questions that will be raised uh, after you will start the exercise yes okay perfect okay? then see you again at 10 40 so in 15 minutes okay in 15 minutes okay okay see you, for you. yes <laughs> okay <laughs> yes okay see you, see you.